Hey everyone, I'm Elad of Estrelave Diagnostics, and I'm very excited uh, to welcome you to the first episode of Single Cellmates. Uh, in this series, I will interview influential and interesting figures in the world of immune monitoring. And the goal is to learn uh, about their background in the field and hear their thoughts on current and future uh, challenges. And today we are joined by Dr. Sophie Van Gessen, who is a researcher at the VAB, the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology, and at Ghent University. And uh, Sophie is renowned for her many contributions to, uh, to single cell uh, computational biology, and notably the flowsome algorithms um, and many other tools. So hi, Sophie, thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. And uh, I was just saying, we were just talking before the, uh, the interview started, and I was telling uh, Sophie um, that I've been using her code for years now, and this is the first time we actually meet. Very great to finally meet you indeed, and it's thank lovely you. to see how much uh, interest the uh, computational flow world is, is gathering and that more and more people are really interested in using these tools and I think you've done great contributions in that as well. Likewise. And talk to you. I think, I think some would argue that it's about time computational <laughs> work is getting some attention. So, um, so let's start with your, in, in some ways, with your call to fame with Flowsum. Uh, so Flowsum is based on, on self-organizing maps and that's a method that goes back, I think, to the 80s Maybe even, maybe maybe even before that, um, could you please tell me about your history with with self-organizing maps and and the path to bringing it to single cell data? Okay, so just as some background there, I studied computer science, uh, so I had heard about it in some courses on machine learning and data mining and so on. Uh, I'm not sure if I've really used it a, a lot yet at that point. Um, and actually, uh, Professor Ivan Seiss, my supervisor uh, for my PhD, proposed that we could give it a try. And the reasoning behind it was, um, was actually two things. On the one hand, uh, we know it's a fast technique, which was our main goal at that point, because there were some tools out there, for example, Spade. And our, our main goal was really not necessarily improving the quality, which was already quite okay, but especially improving the speed uh, of the algorithm. And then the other reason uh, we chose the self-organizing map was that it has this visualization option because it's by itself already finds this visualization structure, um, which you don't have if you just apply a, a k-means or something like this. And I think in the end, looking back on it now from, from where we are now, where most of the time we use the minimal spanning tree for the visualization, that actually we could just as well have gone with k-means um, Quality-wise, for the clustering, it would not make a huge difference, uh, I think. But what the self-organizing map really brought to the to single cell data is this idea of over-clustering, of doing this two-step clustering of first going way too much, and then with a slower algorithm, you, on that level, you can do um, much more detailed clustering to go to your cell population level. And I think that idea is really thanks to first going by the self-organizing map and that we maybe would not have thought of this approach uh, with something like k-means while well, with self-organizing maps this is quite typically done um, and so then it turned out that it, it seemed quite a good approach for single cell data and that, uh, but more and more people in the field seem uh, seem to be using now so that's really very rewarding for me that we could give a little help there in, in the analysis of all this exciting data yeah and um I agree that during my PhD, I was working on a very early version of Phenograph. And like you said, the clustering quality was good, but the running speed was very high. You look at all these benchmarks where the x-axis is the clustering quality and the y-axis is the running speed. And Flosum is always far to the bottom right, bottom right, showing that it's much faster than everything else out there. Um, and I, I appreciate what you said about overclustering. I think that when looking for rare, rare, cell, rare, rare, rare cell subsets, it's really critical to have that kind of, of, uh, of behavior. And um, I'm wondering, so when I was working with Tisney back in the day, we were struggling with how to represent the data. And then we ran Tisney, the first Tisney we ran, Dana Payer and me on, the day, on, on, on a side of data set, really looked amazing. It was really a breakthrough moment that was just one run of the algorithm. I'm wondering if you had a similar experience with self-organizing maps, or did you have a longer path to actually making it work? 
I think for me, the a bit like you're saying, the, the first impression was good. We did spend still quite some time on really optimizing the visualization mm -hmm. and still playing around with that uh, sometimes. Like, what do you, what can you put in one of these little circles? We typically have star pots showing multiple markers, which at that point was also not really possible with Spade or Disney, that you only had one marker per visualization. So there we improved. Uh, we went with these background colors to represent different types of information. So I think to the final way we are using it on a day-by-day -day basis now, that took quite some time, but immediately the first result looked really promising and, and indeed the, the uh, increase in speed, I think also showed up very quickly, which showed us it was the way to go uh, there. Yeah, and um, going back to your comment about the visualization, I really like how how your minimum spanning trees are very dense with all the data and information you can get out of them. And in some ways, I think you're sitting in the intersection between clustering and dimensionality reduction, allowing people to access so much wealth of information. Yeah, I wouldn't call it dimensionality reduction because for me, I think about it really in a the very defined way that we lose the single cell level. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would only call it dimensionality reduction if you would stay at the single cell level. Um, but it's true that just capturing all this information, it takes also a little bit of time to get used to it. So I feel like for some people, and also really depending on the occasion, maybe just representing it in a heat map can be more easily accessible, uh, things like that. But then when you really start exploring your data and you're spending a lot of time on it, creating these dense information, heavy uh, plots can be really helpful to get a good insight in what's actually going on on your data. Uh, and, and the more different ways to visualize things, the more things you try out and explore, always the better, I think. Yeah, I agree. And going back and forth between heat maps and the spanning trees and other visualizations. Exactly. Um, so <clears throat> many of the parameters from, from self-organizing maps are available through Flowsum, I think all of them, but you also add different parameters just for your implementation. And one of them, which I think is less familiar to the community, but is of special interest to me is the importance parameter. And for those of us who don't know, the, the importance parameter scales all of the input parameters, the marker intensities, according to a vector of weights. And in my experience, it really helps you address some inconsistencies in the data, especially with flow or mass cytometry, where the intensity on one marker is much higher than others just because of the signal from the instrument. Uh, so I'm wondering what prompted you to add this parameter and could you discuss some of its use cases? Yeah, I think in general, just, just to tie in with what you were saying there, indeed it's, it's very um, important actually that the scale of the data kind of goes together with the, the biological meaning of the data. Um, and for example, when you're working with flow data, um, typically your scatters are in a completely different scale than your transformed fluorescence values. Mm -hmm. We, we brought in the scale parameter and so on to, to handle that. But indeed, if you want more fine tuning, then just this basic z-score normalization that the scale is doing might not be enough uh, for, for your goal. And then this importance parameter could, could help you out. Um, the main reason we actually started using it was because there was um, a specific researcher who had this setting where a certain set of parameters or of markers included in the panel were really used to define the main cell types. And then there was another set of markers which was maybe a bit less relevant, a bit more exploratory, see what's going on there and so on. And then in our first run, actually things were splitting really strongly on some of the markers that were maybe biologically less uh, of, of relevance. Um, one example I can think about, I'm, not entirely sure anymore if it was in this first use case, but another uh, point where we use it was, for example, you have the CD4, CD8 split, and then you have a whole bunch of other markers. And then if for some reason it starts splitting on these other markers, but your CD4 and your CD8s are still mixed, mm -hmm. this is very counterintuitive from a biological setting. We really want to tell the algorithm, no, first split on CD4, CD8, this is our main 
uh, thing of interest with strong biological meaning and then go on further splitting based on the other markers. And so these are the cases uh, where, where we have used it. I have to be honest that we don't use it that often because I find it's sometimes a bit tricky to really decide on these weights. You have to decide on these numeric values explaining exactly the importance of all these markers. So it's okay if you just have like one or two levels of importance where you say, okay, I set these markers apart, I give them a different value than the other, but I've never gone to really like set a different score for all the different uh, markers and so on. It's, it's easy to get lost a bit uh, there as well, I think. So, so use it with caution, but in some cases it can for sure be very helpful. That's really interesting to me because I use it all the time <laughs> and okay. we have a set of heuristics that I have a set of heuristics that decide on the importance for a given data set. Okay. So maybe we should have a separate discussion about that because uh, I'm curious to hear your feedback. Um, but then I think that that could also make sense that you really try to, to learn there based on the data, but just setting it by hand, this might be tricky. Oh wait, I wouldn't imagine setting it by hand. I didn't know that exactly. like, from the moment I saw it, I tried to find heuristics to do it automatically, but I'm really curious <laughs> that you've been tailoring it and um, drawing parallels to another method, I'm thinking about hierarchical Disney that is mm -hmm. trying to achieve a similar thing where you yeah. try to find the big differences first. And yeah, exactly. I, I like how you use the importance to do it in a bit of a softer way, not just yeah, deciding exactly. these are the markers and these are the markers. So, so clustering is just one step of analyzing the data. And one of the concepts I've been trying to promote uh, outside of computational biology is the idea of an analysis pipeline, which I think for bioinformaticians is pretty trivial, but for people who are coming from the bench is a bit more foreign. So just to, to briefly explain, to the viewers, an analysis pipeline is just a series of methods or tools of algorithms that you take the data from. So you start from the raw data and then you clean it and then you cluster it and then you run statistical analysis. So it's just a, an established series of steps that the data goes through. And, and clustering is an important part of it um, when, you, uh, when you work on the data, but, but there's many other elements when you, when you do your analysis. And I'm wondering in your experience, um, what, if, what are some of the analytical challenges that uh, researchers face outside of clustering? Okay, um, I think on the one hand, um, overall the statistics and prediction algorithms and so on are going quite okay. One thing you run into there once in a while is the multiple testing issue. If you start creating lots of clusters, lots of MFIs for each of the clusters and so on, um, so that can make things a little bit complex. I think at some point you just need to realize, okay, if we test so many things, there is indeed a chance that we will find things just by accident. Um, and in that case, I see it more as hypothesis generating, that you just look what my top results are coming out and then they still need to be validated later in a separate occasion. So that, that would be my way to, to handle that. The main thing that I feel we are um, often still struggling with in these pipelines is really the pre-processing and the cleaning. Um, you get the data from someone and just running FlowSum on it, running some statistics on it, that's all fine. But really knowing that the numbers you get are the values that are telling you something about the biology and not just about some technical artifacts that were happening during the measurement of the data, this is still tricky. And then. Um, we look at normalization, we look at cleaning, at all these things, but knowing what is suited when, uh, in which cases to apply, um, still stays a bit of a challenge, I think, and is also something we're like actively uh, doing research on right now. And um, I, I agree with your point around multiple testing correction, and for me at least, it's another one of these blind, point, blind spots that for me, it's obvious and trivial, but when speaking with immunologists, they're pretty, they're not familiar with the idea of multiple testing correction. And for many of them, it's even disappointing because you run the analyses, you get p-values, which are pretty good according to their definition, but then you apply multiple testing correction and suddenly everything is washed out. Um, and they're asking, why did we do this? And well, you have to, that's the statistical approach that you need to take, but there are some, there's some challenge with managing expectations around the idea of multiple testing correction. But I think just maybe with managing expectations regarding p-values in general, like they're always telling you something about how 
big as the chance that this would happen and so on, but it doesn't necessarily tell you this is what's relevant in biology. And the fact that this is not a one-on-one -on -one mapping uh, is also an idea that still needs to spread a bit more, I feel sometimes. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, I think people are finally starting to get away from the idea of just p-value and significance, but you're absolutely right that there's still some advocacy and education that needs to be done around that. Um, you mentioned normalization and cleaning, and I think that's a great segue to my next question. Um, you recently published Cytonorm, which is a method for the normalization of cytometry data using reference uh, samples, either spike-ins or samples that will run in parallel to the main experiment. Um, I'm curious, what is the rationale uh, behind the, uh, the Cytonorm algorithm? Okay. Um, I think there are a few things played a role. The um, first thing we really noticed when we were starting to inspect these, these batch effects and, and the shifts that we, we were noticing in the data was that they often seemed to be uh, not just a linear uh, shift, for example, that your negative population would really stay exactly the same and only the positive one was impacted or the other way around. And this really gave us the idea that just scaling or just um, shifting data around would not be enough uh, to really capture the effect. And for that reason, we choose to use the, the quantile uh, normalization approach. So where you're really kind of capturing your whole distribution in these quantiles instead of just taking this one big block and really shifting the whole thing that you can do a more fine-tuned approach. Uh, so this was one of, of the, the main ideas there. The other idea was that we also noticed that in some cases there seemed to be some cell type specific effects. So that it really was not that all the data behaved exactly the same way, but that maybe the, what actually was on your cell, the technical artifacts could uh, impact it differently. And so for that reason, we also included this clustering step um, in the algorithm. Um, to really be able to capture these cell type specific effects better. And then I think, um, looking back on it, so this is how we came up with it kind of, but then looking back on it with the quantile distribution, you're also really sensitive that your control needs to be very similar for all of them because if suddenly you have, in one uh, case, your positive population is 30 percent of the cells and then in the other control it's suddenly 35 with your quantas you will really start shifting things around there so having the clustering step in there also makes it a little bit more robust to these accidental mistakes uh, that could happen otherwise so i think these are the two main concepts of, of the cytonorm on the one hand that we have the clustering step and then per cluster we will apply the quantile normalization that makes sense and um when I, when I was reading the paper, one of the things I was thinking about is that, um, first of all, what you mentioned about the clustering uh, because of different behaviors between different cell subsets. And also in my mind, many markers only appear on a given subset. So trying to normalize them over the entire data set is not gonna be very helpful. When you mm -hmm. look at the distribution, it's just a long tail, but then you go to the correct subset and finally, and suddenly you have some beautiful peak or some signal. Yeah. So by, by doing your approach of first clustering the data and then normalizing on each of these clusters, I think you can really get access to these markers which are less, uh, less abundant than others. Yeah. So, um, so could you share a story of two or, or two on, on, on how, Cytobion, how Cytonome was used and how it improved the quality of the data? And when speaking to researchers, I often refer to these two as, as horror stories, where there was some glaring issue with the data set and then the algorithm actually fixed it. So I'm really curious to hear if you have any of these. Well, we're still uh, working with some of the ongoing projects. I think actually the example in the paper was a nice one. There, it was more of a, of a retrospective thing because by then the data uh, was already published, but then we had a look and we could see that really after applying the algorithm, a more static gating could make sense. And then I think the static gating is not that important per se. It's just that otherwise you can't compare MFIs, what people are still often doing. For the percentages, if you shift your gates around, that's fine and it will work out. But for MFIs, it's really important that you can compare the numbers 
and we could show that that this also made sense in 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 this setting um in some ongoing projects we really saw that they were run um clinical studies over a long time period and then you just have so much many batch effects um popping up and then we could really see improvements we're still fine-tuning all the parameters a bit having the clustering correct is is important you don't want to over cluster you don't want to under cluster because it can all have some specific artifacts uh, as a result. So it's still a, a work in progress, but that seems very promising. Mm -hmm. And one um, use case that's maybe a bit special because it's not exactly how we propose it in the paper, is that we're also exploring right now if we can use it in cases where we don't have uh, the control, mm -hmm. a sample taken along, because I'm still very convinced that you should try to include as many controls as possible, but often just the data is measured, the data is there, and then having to say, okay, then we can't do anything, just throw it away, is, is also really a pity. Um, so there we're also exploring this idea of maybe um, if you take a whole batch of data together, that overall um, you have a bit of everything. So on average, it would look very similar or is supposed to look very similar to another batch, which also has a bit of everything. And so we're also trying there if we can use some kind of aggregate averaged out thing over the whole batch as the control sample uh, to then normalize all the individual uh, samples in the end. So to avoid that we really do a sample by sample thing where you lose all the important biological information to do a kind of batch by batch um correction and i think that that's also it's looking quite promising right now so even without uh, the control samples still if you have any opportunity to add the control samples and them, don't take this as a as a, a guidance to not to not have them but if they're not there maybe we can still do something with this algorithm and that's also really exciting to me i i like your plea i i, I imagine you speaking to a a bench scientist and telling them, telling her, please include the control samples. And, yes. um, <laughs> and I think that it's a position that I've been in many times. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about this idea of, um, of normalizing without a reference sample for, so I actually had just had a correspondence with a researcher yesterday and, and he was asking me, can we apply cytonorm to my data set? And my reply was, you don't have reference samples. And he was confused because he didn't understand you need them for the algorithm. So I want to make sure I understand your description. We have these different acquisition batches and in each acquisition batch, we had some number of samples, three, seven, 10, who knows how many. And mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is aggregating all of the samples in a given batch and using them as the reference for the algorithm? Yes, but then again, really double check that, that things are making sense, that there's not too many effects on the clusters and so on. So I think that the quality control that you're doing inside of the normalization um, is even more important in that case. And that's also what we're exploring right now. But the way you described it, that's exactly the idea. Okay, got it. That's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it myself. And um, another thing I was wondering about in the context of normalization and reference samples, I think that more often than not, people use PBMCs as a reference spike in. And then the experiment itself might be a varied set of, uh, of tissues. Some of them might be blood, but they might be others as well. Do you have any experience or comments on using PBMC spike ins for a non PBMC uh, sample normalization? I think my main comment would be be careful. Uh, always try to have your control. <laughs> To your data as possible but I, I completely understand that in some cases it's just practically not feasible to have exactly the same type of tissue uh, taken along for a control so then better a PBMC than nothing um, I think that the important thing is that you need to at least spend the range of values that could be expressed so if you know that certain markers will be expressed in your tissue and they're not appearing on PBMC at all maybe Check if you have some other positive control you can also take along um, from, I don't know, a cell line or something, th things like that. So that at least you have information about all the, the possible values that can be measured. 
Um, this we also showed in the paper that this is really important and that otherwise you start extrapolating and really strange things can happen. Um, so that would be my main recommendation there. Uh, with the PBMCs, if they span the same range of, of uh, expression, that's already very good. The other thing is, of course, the clustering. Maybe the clustering is not suited if your uh, cells are, have completely different marker pattern. Maybe then it's better to just go for quantum normalization without the clustering, or maybe even just a simple min-max. Actually, my advice is still when people start thinking about normalization that you look at the data first, the main hope is that you will look at it and realize there is no normalization needed like don't apply it if it's not really needed um, and then when you see it's needed try to go for the simplest approach as possible so if a linear transformation is okay maybe use a linear transformation and not a complex approach we were proposing um, because there's always a risk of also creating artifacts when you're running these algorithms and the simpler the algorithm, the better you understand what could go wrong. So just in many cases, we saw the effects are nonlinear. There are these issues. And then we think our solution can be really helpful uh, in all of those cases. But if you don't need it, so much the better for you. That makes perfect sense. And I'm, I'm taking notes in parallel to your, your comments. And I'm just writing down the simpler the algorithm. I think if, if, I had, if I take one big takeaway from this conversation, that's a very inspiring quote to me. That there's a lot of- I certainly stand with that uh, very strongly, yes. Yeah, and I'm gonna quote this to, uh, to researchers I speak with, because there are so many tools out there and some of them are pretty complex. And to me, it makes perfect sense that if you can just, if you can just multiply your data by a constant, maybe that's what you should do. And, exactly. Um, and you mentioned that, um, that when trying to use PBMCs in non-PBMC samples, make sure you have numbers in that channel. Um, I think two common examples for that are RCD-103, a marker of, of tissue resident uh, cells. No PBMC cells should express it, so you can't normalize it with PBMCs. And another very common example are activation markers, where your spike in is not activated, but the actual sample is activated. So don't try to normalize IFN, TNF alpha, if it's not there. Exactly. This is exactly the example we had in the paper, where we compared um, taking a stimulated or a non-stimulated control sample for then correcting either a stimulated or a non-stimulated one. And the best approach was to have both a stimulated and a non-stimulated uh, control sample there. So again, the, the general uh, conclusion of the more controls you have, the better. That's a good idea. So if you do have multiple controls, how do you suggest incorporating them when normalizing? Just doing one at a time or? No, so the way we did is we really, um, so there were two control samples measured on each of, in each of the batches, and we just aggregated them together uh, as the control we used in the algorithm, which caused to all the different cell types to be there and still in similar percentages because you assume they are already similar uh, in the first. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And it goes back to the previous point where you can aggregate yeah. non-reference samples to use them. Exactly, as and, and that worked very well, actually, yeah. Great. So we already touched on some of this, but in your opinion, what are some of the easy steps a researcher can take to improve the quality of her data? And I'm talking about before the analysis, as she's planning the experiment or acquiring the data. So we talked about reference samples. Uh, do you have any ideas for other steps that, that could be taken? I think reference samples is really my, my strongest thing. Also, if you have markers which you know are really only expressed very little or very hard to determine, try to take an FMO along this, this type of thing. Um, otherwise, I think a, a good experiment design, like it, luckily I'm mainly working together with people who are already doing this, but like don't measure all your controls in one day and then all the samples of interest on the other day and hope to find the differences between them because then you have no clue what's technical and what not. So this experiment design is really important. Um, 
maybe some something silly, but also makes life of a bioinformatician much easier is label things correctly and consistently. Um, because if suddenly names are changed and all these kind of things, it always is a risk uh, of making mistakes later on. So the, the more consistent you can be in those things, the better. Um, and also it saves time of us having to change all the names everywhere, these kind of things. Um, and I think overall just standardization as much as possible, not only consistency in giving the names, but also consistency in how you handle the samples. Uh, that, that all the technical influence is really uh, as limited as possible. I, um, I was laughing at your comment about consistently naming channels. It's surprising how often that part is missed. And <laughs> I think one testament to that is all the different tools that exist to harmonizing the panel and making mm -hmm. sure everything is named consistently. Um, and um, I don't know what is worse, opening a data set and seeing that none of the none of the channels are labeled it's all just the name of the floor fours or the uh, or the metals or the other alternative that you get the data and you analyze it and then you sit with the researcher and they say oh no actually that was not cd11b that was uh, i don't know cd19 like oh okay that's that's good to know <laughs> thank you <laughs> things make yes. more sense now um, i've so seen both cases happen and indeed it's Surprising for us, maybe sometimes, especially coming from the computer science background, you know, then sometimes you assume these things are straightforward. But then I was also running along in the lab one day just like to get the experience and get some insight. And then you see how much things are involved. So I, I also have a lot of understanding now for that things are not always as easy for the people in the lab as we present them uh, like, oh, take along all the FMOs. Yeah, okay, that, that's not always the most practical thing to do, things like that. So I have the, the understanding that it's not easy, but if you can make the effort and if you can do the, the, the work to really be as precise as possible, as consistent as possible, you will also get the most out of your data. And that can be maybe worth it to really make sure all the money and time you're investing in an experiment will also uh, give you some output in the end that, that's relevant for, for patients or, or just understanding of biology in general. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's all about being consistent and, and standardizing as much as possible. Exactly. Um, so you're in a very opportune spot where you've, as far as I remember, you've been working with both flow and mass cytometry data. Um, do you have any any insights on addressing the differences between them as a computational biologist? I think in most cases, actually, the differences are relatively limited. So most of the tools you can apply on both. I think that's also um, something we're really trying to pay attention to now when we're developing tools, that we test that it works on both, that we check are there any specific uh, cases occurring. Um, I think, of course, the, the, the main difference from, from when you're running computational tools is that you have this huge zero peak in mass data. And sometimes it can make sense to try to work around that a little bit. Uh, like if you're making your density distribution, I've even seen very simple uh, ways to just leave out the zeros so you can actually see the rest of the distribution, things like that. So there you have some, some small tweaks. Um, I don't know what comes to mind is if you're running Flow AI, probably you need to tweak the time parameter a bit because it's in a different time unit and then Flow AI gets confused and, and things like that. Um, but overall, I have the impression that next to these small tweaks, most tools are actually um, relevant for both the types of data. Um, one thing which I don't think is really the flow versus mass difference, but more the low versus high parameter uh, difference, is that if you have more and more markers, uh, which you are including, maybe nowadays also in some of the flow systems, um, where you're saying, okay, these are the markers that I really want to use to define my cell types, and these are some markers that I'm including just out of interest or even more functional markers, things like that, is that maybe you want to treat those differently from your real cell type defining markers. Um, so I think that's a relevant thing to consider in most mass cytometry cases. 
and like I said, nowadays in, in some of the, the flow panels as well. Um, so, so that's something to think about, that you're not adding too much noise in your first analysis steps. Um, maybe the clustering will be cleaner if you work on a subset of the data. And I know you're super excited that you measured all this data, but still let's build up to it and not necessarily use all of it at once. Um, I think that that's the main thing that comes to mind um, in, in that aspect. That's, uh, I think these are really great points. And um, the, the separation between different types of markers, what do you use for phenotyping? What do you use for behavior? It's out there. I mean, Phenograph is talking about it. DiffSight is talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of computational tools are mentioning that point. So, so thank you for raising it. And um, I, uh, I, I want to just give a brief shout out that you, you alluded to flow cytometry with a large number of markers. Um, there's two instruments, the Cytochorora and the BD Symphony both of which in many ways are comparable to the CITOF with their power and capability to get many different markers. And I think many people forget about that. Um, so you mentioned that when testing the algorithm, you should test it on both flow and mass cytometry. Do you have any, any favorite data sets that you use often? Or do you really go with the latest project and use the data from them? Um, it depends a bit, little bit. Actually, in several cases we we go indeed the other way around that we have the project we see if there are tools out there which we can use on them and then if it turns out that the tools are not there or not doing exactly what we want that's the reason to start developing a new tool so then of course your first focus is also on this specific data set where the need was created uh, for the tool uh, and i think that's actually the case in most of our projects however then uh, once you're further in finalizing the tool, then you say, okay, now we also want to test it on some, some different cases. I don't think I have like one specific favorite data set, but I want to give a shout out to the Flow repository, which is just such a great um, database containing so, so much data. So then we often just go have a look in there, what is suited for our specific uh, tool or question that, that we want to, to address right now. Um, also, depending a bit like data sets that you see returning in literature that you think, okay, maybe I should have a look at that one uh, as well. Sometimes also things just easy, okay, this is what I have on my computer, let's try it on this one, uh, because this is the quickest accessible. Um, it, it depends a bit on case by case. I, I wouldn't really mention like one specific data set that's out there that I'm using all the time. Um, and like I said, in many cases, we actually go the other way around. We have the data and then we start looking for the tools that, that, can, that are suitable for that specific question that is asked. Yeah, that makes sense. And, uh, and thank you for mentioning the Flow Repository. I agree that it's an amazing resource. And um, Isaac had a, had a call for a proposal a few months ago where they mentioned that they're planning to upgrade it. So I'm really looking forward to Flow Repository uh, version 2. So uh, that's all the questions on my end. Anything else you would like to add? Any messages to the community? Not very. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you off guard. I'm sorry about that. The, the, the one thing that, that we already mentioned is just um, do quality control as much as possible. And not only in the sense of, of how I typically mean it, where, okay, check the quality of your data first before you put it in any algorithm but also when running the algorithm, visualize the results in different ways, Just really check what's going on, if things are making sense. And if they're not making sense, don't always automatically assume the algorithm is wrong. Sometimes your assumption can be wrong as well. But if don't, things don't line up, check out what's going on. It could also be some uh, parameter mistake, things like that. So visualize as much as possible and, and double check your quality. Of, of what you're doing. That, that would be my, my main message to everyone trying these computational tools. And you mentioned don't blame the algorithm. I'm mm -hmm. going to add a corollary to that. Don't expect the algorithm to fix it. <laughs> Sometimes it's just a flaw with the data set. So Sophie, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I would also like to thank our editor, uh, Heather Dwyer, and uh, Mihai Kuman, who is Astrolabe's uh, designer-in-chief. And um, Thank you, the listeners, for uh, tuning in. 
please make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and LinkedIn. We're going to have more of these episodes in the future. And finally, if you are interested in this field, um, whether from the computational aspect or the immunology aspect, uh, please check out the Immune Monitoring Biweekly. It's a regular newsletter that we put out, and it's full of content about uh, the latest methods, both in, on the bench and um, in the bioinformatics side. So thanks again, Sophie. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again for having me. Good luck with this web series. Thank you.